Section 5 of The Good Dog Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. W. Raptor A Dog of Flanders, Part 3 By Weeder 7. Noel was close at hand. The weather was very wild and cold. The snow was six feet deep, and the ice was firm enough to bear oxen and men upon it everywhere. At this season the little village was always gay and cheerful. At the poorest dwelling there were posets and cakes, joking and dancing, sugared saints and gilded Jesus. The merry Flemish bells jingled everywhere on the horses. Everywhere within doors some well-filled soup pot sang and smoked over the stove, and everywhere over the snow without laughing maidens patted in bright kerchiefs and stout kirtles, going to and from the mass. Only in the little hut it was very dark and very cold. Nello and Petrush were left utterly alone. For one night in the week before the Christmas day, death entered there, and took away from life forever old Yehan Das, who had never known of life, aught save its poverty and its pains, he had long been half dead, incapable of any movement except a feeble gesture, and powerless for anything beyond a gentle word. And yet his loss fell on them both with a great horror in it. They mourned him passionately. He had passed away from them in his sleep, and when in the grey dawn they learned their bereavement, unutterable solitude and desolation seemed to close around them. He had long been only a poor, feeble, paralysed old man, who could not raise a hand in their defence, but he had loved them well. His smile had always welcomed their return. They mourned for him unceasingly, refusing to be comforted, as in the white winter day they followed the deal shell that held his body to the nameless grave by the little grey church. They were his only mourners, these two whom he had left friendless upon earth, the young boy and the old dog. "'Surely he will relent now, and let the poor lad come hither?' thought the miller's wife, glancing at her husband where he smoked by the hearth. Bas Cogues knew her thought. But he hardened his heart and would not unbar his door as the little, humble funeral went by. "'The boy is a beggar,' he said to himself. "'He should not be about Alois.' The woman dared not say anything aloud. But when the grave was closed and the mourners had gone, she put a wreath of immortals into Alois' hands and bade her go and lay it reverently on the dark, unmarked mound where the snow was displaced. Nello and Petrush went home with broken hearts. But even of that poor, melancholy, cheerless home they were denied the consolation. There was a month's rent overdue for their little home. And when Nello had paid the last sad service to the dead, he had not a coin left. He went and begged grace of the owner of the hut, a cobbler who went every Sunday night to drink his pint of wine and smoke with Bas Corges. The cobbler would grant no mercy. He was a harsh, miserly man and loved money. He claimed in default of his rent every stick and stone, every pot and pan in the hut, and bade Nello and Petrash be out of it on the morrow. Now, the cabin was lowly enough, and in some sense miserable enough, and yet their hearts clove to it with a great affection. They had been so happy there, and in the summer, with its clambering vine and its flowering beans, it was so pretty and bright in the midst of the sun-lighted fields. Their life in it had been full of labour and privation, and yet they had been so well content, so gay of heart running together to meet the old man's never-failing smile of welcome. All night long the boy and the dog sat by the fireless hearth in the darkness, drawn close together for warmth and sorrow. Their bodies were insensible to the cold, but their hearts seemed frozen in them. When the morning broke over the white, chill earth, it was the morning of Christmas Eve, with a shudder, Nello clasped close to him his only friend, while his tears fell hot and fast on the dog's frank forehead. Let us go, Petrush, 
dear, dear Petrash, he murmured. We will not wait to be kicked out. Let us go. Petrash had no will but his, and they went sadly side by side, out from the little place which was so dear to them both, in which every humble homely thing was to them precious and beloved. Petrash dropped his head wearily as he passed by his own green cart. It was no longer his. It had to go with the rest to pay the rent, and his brass harness lay idle and glittering on the snow. The dog could have lain down beside it and died for very heart sickness as he went. But whilst the lad lived and needed him, Petrash would not yield and give way. They took the old accustomed road into Antwerp. The day had yet scarce more than dawned. Most of the shutters were still closed, but some of the villages were about. They took no notice whilst the dog and the boy passed by them. At one door, Nello paused and looked wistfully within. His grandfather had done many a kindly turn, in neighbour's service to the people who dwelt there. "'Would you give Petrush a crust?' he said timidly. "'He is old, and he has had nothing since last forenoon.' The woman shut the door hastily murmuring some vague saying about wheat and rye being very dear that season. The boy and the dog went on again wearily. They asked no more. By slow and painful ways they reached Antwerp as the chimes told ten. "'If I had anything about me, I could sell to get him bread,' thought Nello. But he had nothing except the wisp of linen and serge that covered him and his pair of wooden shoes." Petrush understood, and nestled his nose into the lad's hand, as though to pray him not to be disquieted for any woe or want of his. The winner of the drawing prize was to be proclaimed at noon, and to the public building where he had left his treasure Nello made his way. On the steps and in the entrance hall was a crowd of youths, some of his age, some older, all with parents or relatives or friends. His heart was sick with fear as he went amongst them, holding Petrush close to him. The great bells of the city clashed out the hour of noon with brazen clamour. The doors of the inner hall were opened. The eager panting throng rushed in. It was known that the selected pitcher would be raised above the rest upon a wooden dais. A mist obscured Nello's sight. His head swam. His limbs almost failed him. When his vision cleared he saw the drawing raised on high it was not his own a slow sonorous voice was proclaiming aloud that victory had been adjudged to stephen kesslinger born in the burg of antwerp son of a wharfinger in that town when nello recovered his consciousness he was lying on the stones without and Petrush was trying with every art he knew to call him back to life in the distance, a throng of the youths of Antwerp were shouting around their successful comrade and escorting him with acclamations to his home upon the quay. The boy staggered to his feet and drew the dog into his embrace. "'It's all over, dear Petrush, he murmured. "'All over!' He rallied himself as best he could, for he's weak from fasting, and retraced his steps to the village." Petrash paced by his side with his head drooping and his old limbs feeble from hunger and sorrow. 8. The snow was falling fast. A keen hurricane blew from the north. It was bitter as death on the plains. It took them long to traverse the familiar path, and the bells were sounding four of the clock as they approached the hamlet. Suddenly Petrash paused, arrested by a scent in the snow, scratched, whined, and drew out with his teeth a small case of brown leather. He held it up to Nello in the darkness. Where they were there stood a little calvary, and a lamp burned dully under the cross. The boy mechanically turned the case to the light. On it was the name of Bas Cogues, and within it were notes for two thousand francs. The sight roused the lad a little from his stupor. He thrust it in his shirt and stroked Petrush and drew him onward. The dog looked up wistfully in his face 
Nello made straight for the mill house and went to the house door and struck on its panels. The miller's wife opened it weeping, with little Alwa clinging close to her skirts. Is it thee, thou poor lad? she said kindly through her tears. Get thee gone, ere the Basque has see thee. We are in sore trouble to night. He is out seeking for a power of money that he has let fall riding homeward, and in this snow he never will find it. And God knows it will go nigh to ruin us. It is heaven's own judgment for the things we have done to thee. Nello put the note case in her hand and called Patrash within the house. Patrash found the money tonight, he said quickly. Tell Basque so. I think he will not deny the dog shelter and food in his old age. Keep him from pursuing me, and I pray of you to be good to him. Ere either woman or dog knew what he meant. He had stooped and kissed Patrash, then closed the door hurriedly and disappeared in the gloom of the fast-falling night. The woman and the child stood speechless with joy and fear. Patrash vainly spent the fury of his anguish against the iron-bound oak of the barred house door. They did not dare unbar the door and let him forth. They tried all they could to solace him. They brought him sweet cakes and juicy meats. They tempted him with the best they had. They tried to lure him to abide by the warmth of the hearth, but it was of no avail. Patrash refused to be comforted or to stir from the barred portal. It was six o'clock when from an opposite entrance the miller at last came, jaded and broken, into his wife's presence. It is lost for ever, he said with an ashen cheek and a quiver in his stern voice. We have looked with lanterns everywhere. It is gone, the little maiden's portion and all. His wife put the money into his hand and told him how it had come to her. The strong man sank trembling into a seat and covered his face, ashamed and almost afraid. I have been cruel to the lad, he muttered at length. I deserve not to have good at his hands. Little Awa, taking courage, crept close to her father and nestled against him fair curly head. Nello may come here again, father? She whispered. He may come tomorrow, as he used to do? The miller pressed her in his arms. His hard, sunburnt face was very pale and his mouth trembled. Surely, surely, he answered his child. He shall bide here on Christmas Day and any other day he will. God helping me, I will make amends to the boy. I will make amends. Little Awa kissed him in gratitude and joy, then slid from his knees and ran to where the dog kept watch by the door. And tonight I may feast Patrash, she cried in a child's thoughtless glee. Her father bent his head gravely. Ay, ay, let the dog have the best for the stern old man was moved and shaken to his heart's depths. It was Christmas Eve, and the mill-house was filled with oak logs and squares of turf, with cream and honey, with meat and bread, and the rafters were hung with wreaths of evergreen, and the calvary and the cuckoo clock looked out from a mass of holly. There were little paper lanterns too for Alois, and toys of various fashions and sweetmeats in bright pictured papers. There were light and warmth and abundance everywhere, and the child would fain have made the dog a guest honoured and feasted. But Patrash would neither lie in the warmth nor share in the cheer. Famished he was, and very cold, but without Nello he would partake neither of comfort nor food. Against all temptation he was proof, and close against the door he leaned always, watching only for a means of escape. He wants a lad, said Bascogues. Good dog, good dog, I will go over to the lad the first thing at day dawn. For no one but Patrash knew that Nello had left the hut, and no one but Patrash divined that Nello had gone to face starvation and misery alone. The mill kitchen was very warm. Great logs crackled and flamed on the hearth. Neighbours came in for a glass of wine and a slice of the fat goose baking for supper. Alwa, gleeful and sure of her playmate back on the morrow, bounded and sang and tossed back her yellow hair. Bas Cogges, in the fullness of his heart, smiled on her through moistened eyes and spoke of the way in which he would befriend her favourite companion. The house mother sat with calm, contented face at the spinning wheel. The cuckoo and the clock chirped mirthful hours. 
Amidst it all, Petrush was bidden with a thousand words of welcome to tarry there a cherished guest. But neither peace nor plenty could allure him where Nello was not. When the supper smoked on the board, and the voices were loudest and gladdest, and the Christ child brought choicest gifts to Alois, Petrush, watching always on an occasion, glided out when the door was unlatched by a careless newcomer, and as swiftly as his weak and tired limbs would bear him sped over the snow in the bitter black night, he had only one thought, to follow Nello. A human friend might have paused for the pleasant meal, the cheery warmth, the cosy slumber, but that was not the friendship of Petrush. He remembered a bygone time when an old man and a little child had found him sick unto death in the wayside ditch. Snow had fallen freshly all the evening long. It was now nearly ten. The trail of the boy's footsteps was almost obliterated. It took Petrush long to discover any scent. When at last he found it, it was lost again quickly, and lost and recovered, and again lost and again recovered, a hundred times or more. The night was very wild. The lamps under the wayside crosses were blown out. The roads were sheets of ice. The impenetrable darkness hid every trace of habitations. There was no living thing abroad. All the cattle were housed, and in all the huts and homesteads men and women rejoiced and feasted. There was only Petrush out in the cruel cold, old and famished and full of pain, but with the strength and the patience of a great love to sustain him in his search. The trail of Nello's steps, faint and obscure as it was under the new snow, went straightly along the custom tracks into Antwerp. It was past midnight when Petrush traced it over the boundaries of the town and into the narrow, tortuous, gloomy streets. It was all quite dark in the town, save where some light gleamed ruddily through the crevices of house shutters, or some group went homeward with lanterns, chanting drinking songs. The streets were all white with ice. The high walls and roofs leaned black against them. There was scarce a sound, save the riot of the winds down the passages as they tossed the creaking signs and shook the tall lamp-irons. So many passers-by had trodden through and through the snow. So many diverse paths had crossed and recrossed each other that the dog had a hard task to retain any hold on the track he followed. But he kept on his way, though the cold pierced him to the bone and the jagged ice cut his feet and the hunger in his body gnawed like a rat's teeth. He kept on his way, a poor, gaunt, shivering thing, and by long patience traced the steps he loved into the very heart of the burg and up the steps of the great cathedral. He has gone to the things that he loved, for Petrush. He could not understand, but he was full of sorrow and of pity for the art passion that to him was so incomprehensible and yet so sacred. The portals of the cathedral were unclosed after the midnight mass. Some heedlessness in the custodians, too eager to go home and feast or sleep, or too drowsy to know whether they turned the key all right, had left one of the doors unlocked. By that accident the footfalls Petrush sought had passed through into the building leaving the white marks of snow upon the dark stone floor. By that slender white thread, frozen as it fell, he was guided through the intense silence, through the immensity of the vaulted space, guided straight to the gates of the chancel, and stretched there upon the stones he found Nello. He crept up and touched the face of the boy. Didst thou dream that I should be faithless and forsake thee, I, a dog? said that mute caress. The lad raised himself with a low cry and clasped him close. Let us lie down and die together, he murmured. Men have no need of us, and we are all alone. In answer, Petrush crept closer yet and laid his head upon the young boy's breast. The great tears stood in his brown, sad eyes. Not for himself, for himself he was happy. They lay close together in the piercing cold. The blasts that blew over the Flemish dikes from the northern seas were like waves of ice, which froze every living thing they touched. 
the interior of the immense vault of stone in which they were was even more bitterly chill than the snow-covered plains without now and then a bat moved in the shadows now and then a gleam of light came on the ranks of carven figures under the rubens they lay together quite still and soothed almost into a dreaming slumber by the numbing narcotic of the cold together they dreamed of the glad old days when they had chased each other through the flowering grasses of the summer meadows or sat hidden in the tall bulrushes by the water's side, watching the boats go seaward in the sun. Suddenly through the darkness a great white radiance streamed through the vastness of the isles. The moon, that was at her height, had broken through the clouds. The snow had ceased to fall. The light reflected from the snow without was as clear as the light of dawn. It fell through the arches full upon the two pitches above, from which the boy on his entrance had flung back the veil. The elevation and the descent from the cross were for one instant visible. Nello rose to his feet and stretched his arms to them. The tears of a passionate ecstasy glistened on the paleness of his face. I have seen them at last, he cried aloud. Oh God, it is enough! His limbs failed under him, and he sank upon his knees, still gazing upward at the majesty that he adored. For a few brief moments the light illuminated the divine visions that had been denied to him so long. Light clear and sweet and strong as though it streamed from the throne of heaven. Then suddenly it had passed away. Once more a great darkness covered the face of Christ. The arms of the boy drew close again the body of the dog. We shall see his face there, he murmured, and he will not part us, I think. On the morrow, by the chancel of the cathedral, the people of Antwerp found them both. They were both dead. The cold of the night had frozen into stillness alike the young life and the old. When the Christmas morning broke and the priests came to the temple, they saw them lying thus on the stones together. Above the veils were drawn back from the great visions of Rubens, and the fresh rays of the sunrise touched the thorn-crowned head of the Christ. As the day grew on, there came an old, hard-featured man who wept as women weep. "'I was cruel to the lad,' he muttered, "'and now—' I would have made amends, yea, to the half of my substance. And he should have been to me as a son. There came also, as the day grew apace, a painter who had fame in the world, and who was liberal of hand and of spirit. I seek one who should have had the prize yesterday, had worth one, he said to the people. A boy of rare promise and genius, an old woodcutter on a fallen tree at eventide, that was all his theme. But there was greatness for the future in it. I would fain find him and take him with me and teach him art. And a little child with curling fair hair, sobbing bitterly as she clung to her father's arm, cried aloud, Oh, Nalu, come. We have all ready for thee. The Christ child's hands are full of gifts, and the old piper will play for us. And the mother says thou shalt stay by the hearth and burn nuts with us all the Noel week long. Yes, even to the feast of the kings. And Petrush will be so happy. O oh, Nello, wake and come. But the young pale face, turned upward to the light of the great Rubens with a smile upon its mouth, answered them all. It is too late. For the sweet sonorous bells went ringing through the frost and the sunlight shone upon the plains of snow, and the populace trooped gay and glad through the streets. But Nello and Petrush no more asked charity at their hands. All they needed now Antwerp gave unbidden. Death had been more pitiful to them than longer life would have been. It had taken the one in the loyalty of love, and the other in the innocence of faith, from a world which for love has no recompense and for faith no fulfilment. All their lives they had been together, and in their deaths they were not divided, 
but when they were found the arms of the boy were folded too closely around the dog to be severed without violence and the people of their little village contrite and ashamed implored a special grace for them and making them one grave lay them to rest there side by side forever end of section 5 read by r w raptor